The Art Newspaper Podcast is brought to you in association with Bonhams, auctioneers since 1793. To find out more, visit bonhams.com. Hello and welcome to the 100th weekly episode of the Art Newspaper Podcast. I'm Ben Luke. Thank you to all of you who join us each week. And for those of you who are new to the podcast, you can find our complete archive wherever you listen. This week, we talk to the US artist Shabalala Self and explore a show about pregnancy at the Foundling Museum in London. But before we begin, just a reminder that you can sign up for free to our daily newsletter with all our latest stories. Go to theartnewspaper.com and click on the newsletter link at the top right of the page. Now, a new exhibition opening at the Whitechapel Gallery this week looks at a new dynamism in figurative painting. Radical Figures, painting in the new millennium, includes ten artists from different parts of the world and different generations, including Cecily Brown, Michael Armitage, Dana Schutz and Tala Madani. Among other things, they're united, according to the Whitechapel's director, Ivana Blaswick, by, quote, a political commitment to representing diversity in race and sexuality at a time when identity itself is becoming increasingly fluid and lost or oppressed histories are being excavated and reclaimed. Among the artists is the American painter Shabalala Self, who in January also opened a solo show at the ICA in Boston. I went to the Whitechapel Gallery to meet her. Shabalala, do you feel that there is a sort of new energy in painting yourself? I mean, your work obviously sits in a sort of an ambiguous space between painting and collage, for instance. Um, I think about my work as kind of existing between more assemblage and painting, but um, I, I only really have the experience of me working at this moment, so I can't say that I, I can't really speak on what the feel or the tone of painting was in the past in any kind of earnest way, but I can say that right now I feel like there's a lot of energy around painting. It's an interesting conversation happening. And, you, of course, your work has a very direct conversation with a lot of the art of the past, too. I'm thinking of people like Faith Ringgold or Ramare Bearden, for instance. Yeah, those are both huge inspirations to my practice. Can you say something about how you engage with them? Um, I'm very much inspired by Romare Bearden, partially because he spent a lot of time in Harlem, where I'm from, and which it, that's a community which I draw a lot of inspiration from, and also his kind of pioneer, the way in which he's a kind of pioneered the field, the field of a collage. Um, in regards to like Faith Ringgold, her use of textile and working with textile has been a huge inspiration to me. Also, just on a more personal level, like I've always had her books as a child because she makes lots of she made lots of children books, so. I think a part of her aesthetic has always been like part of my like visual landscape. But I'm also inspired by other artists, like thinking about like a Noah Perfoy, artists that have used like unconventional materials um, to kind of just you know make their work, kind of create new narratives. Um, those are also artists that are artists like that are also a huge inspiration to me. You mentioned Harlem there, and, and in the show here, we have a really signature work from that Harlem series about bodegas, the, the sort of corner shops. T- tell us about that series, and also this is a particularly significant work, because is it right that Coco actually is a reference to your sister? Yeah, it is. Um, I, met, I made the painting, and I felt like the woman in the painting looked a lot like, like my sister, so I named, <laughs> I named the, you know, the, I guess the protagonist of the painting after her. Um, I was working on 2017, maybe through 2018, on a series that was focused on New York City bodegas. It was called Bodega Run, and I was really kind of unpacking the social and the political significance of those spaces. Um, my work deals a lot with iconography, and I felt like the bodega, in many ways, what mirrored the larger community outside of it. So it as a locale was a very iconic it's an iconic location within Harlem. So I wanted to kind of unpack the significance of that space. And it was just very generative for me to work within an environment, because for so long, I had situated the figures within this liminal space. Um, so I felt like it was like more of a generous move on my part to like my audience to have the figures anchored within this real, like, realistic quotidian space. And, and what's interesting is that I know that when you first showed that, it was in commercial galleries like Pilar Corias in London. And of course, it therefore entered into this idea of a marketplace. And so you, there you are in a, in a, in a gallery where uh, artworks are selling for a large amount of money. And then at the same time, you're showing a kind of very working class kind of uh, commerce in terms of the bodega. Can you say something about that 
relationship that your work deliberately encouraged with a kind of association of value and, 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 and commerce? So I originally had the idea for the project, but then when it comes down to like where the idea will live, um, the project ends up, the first iteration of it was shown in, within a gallery. So I kind of felt like a, um, a, gal a gallery is a commercial space, it's another transactional space, but it's not often acknowledged as such. So I felt as if the bodega was almost the um, antithesis of a, of a gallery. A gallery is a store in which there are, there are no prices and there is no salesperson, <laughs> and I mean, at least one that is conspicuous. And it's a store in which maybe nothing's accessible, whereas the bodega is a store that is, everything is accessible, everything is there. It's almost kind of cluttered with merchandise. Um, so I kind of went to look at, it was, it was interesting to conflate those two spaces, and I think that it kind of heightened the drama, the narrative within, within the particular project. And we, we talked about your sister earlier on, but I'm really interested in the balance between your figures being a kind of archetype or an ideal and how much they actually refer to specific people, including yourself. Can you say something about, about who are we looking at? when we're observing your, your works featuring women? I, f I think that they are kind of a combination of many different... They're kind of composites. Um, I, because I'm making the work, I feel like a lot of myself is in the work. Um, my aspirational self, my real self, maybe this fictionalized version of myself. And then they're all the women I have in my life, all the people I have in my life. I come from a large family. Um, I come from a kind of a bustling city, a bustling community within a large city. Um, so I feel like I, all the memories of people that I have engaged with passively, all of my more intimate relationships, um, even you know figures from pop culture, these, are, these all kind of come together within the work. And you've extended the paintings now into the sort of space on the wall. This happened at your, again, another Pilar Corias show recently, but it's here too, these great red um, figures emerging from the paintings directly on the wall. Tell me about that development in the work. Um, I think that kind of locating a substrate has been like a big part of my practice. Uh, for, I said for a long time, I had done a lot of printmaking. I was working on paper. And at one point, I had kind of hit a wall with that way of working, so I, I was really wanting to like, go back to canvas but I didn't know exactly how to approach going back to canvas, and it was a lot of, for me, even to this day, I guess it's kind of like a tension. I was like, what exactly is my, tr my true substrate? So I guess now with the wall paintings, the wall almost becomes that itself. Um, and because of the, the collage and the assemblage and the applique aspect of the work, the, the paintings in person project somewhat into, it kind of project off of the canvas plane, so to have this wall painting allows for it to be this like deep, for the figures to recede also deep behind the canvas plane as well. Um, so it's really just, it's an installation element. Um, there's definitely a conceptual bend to it, but because it's something that is new to me, I'm still unpacking the, the, the whole relevance of it. I can't quite name it now, but right now I just feel like it's important. And, and tell me about the role of thread and embroidery in the work, because it seems to me that sometimes it's a sort of, um, it's very much like Faith Ringgold in the, in the sense of the way that you're using the sort of blocks of uh, pattern, for instance. But then at other times you're, uh, it seems to me it's more, almost more like a form of drawing in the work. Can you say how you use thread and what, what purpose it serves in the work? Yeah, the stitching has a very utilitarian purpose because that's what allows for all the disparate materials to be held together. But it's also an opportunity for me to draw and to further articulate like various aspects of the paintings. Um, so it really has two functions within the work. Yeah, and then and then of course there's the role of painting itself, which sometimes is used to articulate the faces, which also may sometimes be articulated with using the thread. So I mean, you know, this idea of a painting. To what extent is painting a sort of a uh, useful but quite broad term for the work? I'm interested in this idea of your relationship with painting. Um, I guess my relationship to painting is, I mean, I, I consider myself a painter. I've never considered myself like anything other than that. Um, even when I wasn't making paintings for years, like I think it's just painting is more, it's more of a philosophy, it's more of like a way of thinking about how to create an image. Even beyond image making, I think painting is more of just a way in which someone might process an idea. It's, um, 
I think it's a very expansive medium, and I don't think that I don't think that it, I think it could lend itself to non-linear thinking and action. So um, I definitely feel as if my works exist within the realm of painting. But if I move past making works on canvas, I believe I would still be a painter. You've got a show called Out of Body at ICA Boston. That's an intriguing title, I think, because your work is so connected to the body. So, but it's a sort of an ambiguous title. Can you say more about what the meaning behind the title is? Yeah, um, I, well, I kind of repurposed an older title for that show. I, I had done a show in 2015 um, at a commercial gallery, and I had named a show Out of Body. And at that time, I was thinking a lot about like identity politics in regard to my work. So I was wondering if it was possible to have, um, to be an a work, a artist that works with figuration and to kind of escape the more conventional conversations around like a gendered and racialized body. So out of body referred to kind of that desire partially, but then also I was trying to create space for um, conversation around existentialism in regard to a black to a black body to a female body to a racialized and gendered body so also was thinking about the term out of body referring to a more of a metaphysical or spiritual experience as well yeah and one of the things it seems to me is important in the work in in relation to it, it seems on one hand almost like an abstract pattern but i know it has a very specific um, reference in your work is, the, is this sort of brick pattern that you see throughout the work but it does relate in fact very deeply to that subject matter that you were just discussing doesn't it? Um, the brick pattern actually um, came out of my another series in which the figures were projected into space so street scenes um, I really wanted to find like, a repetitive pattern that could easily kind of communicate this metropolitan space so I landed on this brick motif it was actually um, really much inspired by um, Martin Wong as another artist that I'm like really who, who's made a, bit, a huge influence on my practice so I was thinking about a lot of his paintings from like the late 80s and early 90s so um, that's kind of what I was thinking about for that um, but like any other material that is used or generated within my studio it it gets repurposed and used in different ways and maybe it is an original function so now the brick um, has become a building block um, into making the figures so instead of existing behind them to kind of articulate the space it's actually become part of their bodies and is it right that though there's a, a, there is a specific reference to a Commodore song in there oh yeah of course um, brick house yeah <laughs> I mean that's absolutely true um, especially thinking about kind of how how the, the black female body in particular especially like in a very American context has been described um, thinking about that that kind of um, term maybe it's like a colloquialism like to kind of describe a really sh a shapely woman as a brick house absolutely right and so, and, again, and that speaks to uh, the influences on your work that don't just come from visual art that there is a, it seems to me there's a broad frame of references from writing to music to the visual arts itself yeah I, I feel like I kind of um, all cultural output I've absorbed and it becomes what I mean it becomes absorbed within me as an individual and then obviously it comes out in my work as well and I think I engage a lot with pop culture um, I think I'm, some of my my work, my newer work, I'm going to be trying to really define my relationship to pop culture to clarify it because I feel like in the past it's maybe it's not been so clear to audiences. A strain of your work, which is perhaps less well known than the uh, depictions of women, is is your depictions of men. I wonder that it, 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 they arrived a bit later in your practice. Uh, than the than the women, was it that you felt that you needed to create a a, a a kind of corresponding world of the people that the women might engage with in some way? Yeah, I feel like the male figures are there as foils. They're there as partners. Um, they're there to also a kind of, I guess, give more context about the the interactions and the interpersonal dynamics and. Um, that the women my works have. So the male character is actually very important and it did take me longer to feel like I could depict them. Um, so I'm, I'm very particular about wanting to um, 
make figures in which I feel like I could speak about honestly. And maybe it wasn't until I had more close, close relationships with men in my own life that I felt like I could really tackle that with um, more honesty. Lastly, you've got a, a big show at ICA Boston, which is a solo show, and it's your biggest solo presentation to date. You've got this show here, which is where you're placed amongst other artists. I wonder, do you, have, do you learn different things about your practices from these different kinds of showing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's really great to be shown in a group show, to be shown like, in context with, with other artists. You really learn a lot about the moment in which you're working. And then when you have your, your solo show, you're working um, in this space with this institution and it's kind of really a deep dive into your own practice. You really do learn a lot about where you are at as an individual and what, where you could go. Um, so both experiences are actually really, really important. Um, and I'm thankful for both. And it's actually it's, it's a blessing to be able to do both at the same time. Shabalala, thank you so much. Thank you. Now, while I was at the gallery, I also spoke to Lydia Yee, the Whitechapel's chief curator, about the show. Lydia, you focused on 10 artists here, and that seems to me a really significant statement. You didn't want to just do a kind of general painting survey. Um, yes, that's correct. Um, I felt it was important to look at a range of work by each of the artists and also a, a broader time frame. So if the artist has been working for more than 10 years, it was important to include work from the early part of their career, but also more recent things. Um, can you tell me what unites these particular 10 artists? Because on the one hand, they're very geographically diverse and also from different generations. So what, what do you see as the kind of unifying elements of their work? The artists, I think, share a common uh, relationship with how they represent the figure. Um, it's not anything that's in a kind of realist tradition. There's no portraits in a conventional sense in the exhibition. It's very much imaginative. The artists are bringing together a lot of different sources, whether it's art history or it's pornography. Um, they're bringing together popular culture and fine art and putting it into dialogue. I think they're also very much responding to the ubiquity of photography in social media today. Um, we're all seeing so many images, billions of images are taken and shared daily, and we consume them in seconds. I think they are all t these artists are telling us that we need to slow down. They work in a slow way, painting dries slowly, they build, they layer, they bring in reference. Um, the surfaces are very varied. Um, you don't get that in photography. It's, the photographic surface is seamless. The pixels are, you know, you, you can't tell one from the next. That's really interesting. And I, I wonder also in connecting to that sort of slowness and that slowness of looking to, is a certain ambiguity that painters can play with in terms of we are used to, in the digital age, to these extreme binaries. And there seems to me to be a tremendous amount of blurring going on in these galleries. Yes, um, you can see from the facture in the paintings that the artists are really building up the surface and they're often saying multiple things at once. There's no clear-cut reading to any of these works. While the artists might be representing uh, or referring to a social situation, for example, the migrant crisis um, that's been going on for a number of years now, they're not also making any kind of definitive or declarative message about that. And, and that, that imagery of, let's say, a, a raft um, floating with uh, migrants in the open sea is also layered with the history of art. Um, the artists, um, these painters, are very much also looking to pe people like um, Jericho and the Raft of the Medusa, which um, a couple of hundred years ago now, um, Jericho painted this horrible tragedy at sea in which the Medusa uh, ran aground and um, 150 of the uh, passengers, um, largely I think a military, um, had to abandon ship and get onto a rickety raft. Um, in the end, after days of uh, mutiny and ultimately cannibalism, only 15 survived. So I think these, the artists in the exhibition are very much connecting these historical moments with contemporary ones that you know, say some of the same things. Another thing I was conscious of walking around the galleries was the enormously diverse relationship with the art of the past. You mentioned Jericho there, but there is, there's a real wealth of references here, aren't there? 
Yes, um, it's a language in many ways that can refer to a specific historical moment or a style, um, but it's also, I think, a useful tool for artists um, to be able to develop composition. For example, Dana Schutz has a painting called Man Eating His Chest, and I think she's very much looking at Goya's Saturn um, eating his child. Um, and uh, while Goya's uh, is a kind of fantastical image, uh, Dana's in many ways is also fantasy. It's, it's imagining a kind of perverse scenario. What would it look like for a man to be eating and digesting himself? Whenever there's a kind of an epochal show about painting, in this country in particular, we think of a show called A New Spirit in Painting, which happened in 1981 at the Royal Academy, and which was very much connected to the kind of re-emergence of expressionism, the neo-expressionism. That show, in its time, was deeply controversial, and one of the ways in which it was controversial was that it was seen as a sort of regressive show, particularly politically. This show, it seems to me, deals with very contemporary political issues and therefore is, would you say it would be unlikely that people would see that the show in the same way? Um, the 1981 exhibition at the Royal Academy and New Spirit of Painting and this, that generation of new expressionist artists I think um, were very much kind of dehistoricizing the figure in many ways. Um, they were putting the figure into a timeless mythical landscape and I, none of the artists in this exhibition are doing that. In fact, um, the artists in Radical Figures are very much looking to the contemporary historical moment in weaving history, social concerns, and the figure into the work. I think they're very much echoing um, what Philip Guston said when he stopped painting in an abstract way and turned to figuration. He said, I got sick and tired of all that purity. I just want to tell stories. And I think that storytelling and the, the expressing and engaging with um, contemporary concerns is at the heart of the work of the 10 artists in the exhibition. In, in relation to that storytelling, again, there's, it seems to me, on the one hand, you've mentioned sort of the references to contemporary issues like the refugee crisis, for instance, but there are elements of deeply personal language, it seems to me, and deeply personal references. Do, do they coexist in the same work sometimes? Of course, I don't think any of us can so separate uh, the political aspect of our, our concerns with our personal lives. The, the, the personal very much informs the political. Um, and uh, I think you can see that in, in the ways the artists pull materials together. Um, Michael Armitage, for example, said it was very important to include something um, from his own East African heritage, not only the subject matter, but he's literally painting on a type of bark cloth, labugo, which comes from trees in Uganda. And those trees um, are very specific to the region. And it's, it was important for him to work on this surface rather than on canvas. The other thing that that surface does is that it shows kind of its facture, its, its uh, seams, and, and the perforations. It's not a perfect um, uh, surface on which to paint. You, you talk about the facture and that very strong materiality that we're witnessing in a lot of these artists' work. It's been suggested by Ivona Blazwick that that, that that is in some way possibly a reaction to digital, to pixels to looking at things on a tiny screen, that somehow there's a return to making. I think, I think this interest in materiality is borne out more widely in society. You see things like the slow food movement or people wanting to take a ceramics class, for example, and they want to touch things again that's not glass, that's not on a screen, um, and to have a relationship to the world around them. And, and this is reflected in the paintings in the exhibition. It's, it's not a photorealist kind of painting. Um, the, the work brings in a lot of materials, textures, different types of paints, drawing. It, it's, it's really a collage of elements. And whereas, again, that 1981 show prompted a kind of perception of a movement, I wonder if this show won't necessarily prompt that. It will, in, in a way, it seems to me that the diversity of the ten artists means that, yes, we'll be talking about figurative painting, but we won't necessarily be sort of boxing it in the same way. There seems to be that sort of very diversity, it seems, is, is crucial to the effect of this show. Um, yes, the range, the diversity, the um, ambiguity, the all of these things um, 
I think, point to the direction that this isn't a movement. I mean, there aren't very many kind of cohesive movements anymore, um, except maybe for a very brief moment in time. And um, I think artists want to t uh, speak with their peers and to have this dialogue, but in no ways is it a kind of unified, singular voice. Lydia, thank you so much. Thank you. Shabalala Sell's exhibition Out of Body is at the ICA Boston until the 5th of July. Radical Figures, Painting in the New Millennium, is at the Whitechapel Gallery in London until the 10th of May. A bit later, we'll be looking at a different kind of radical figure in art, pregnant women. But first, here are a few of the top stories on our website this week. In an article written especially for the art newspaper, hans Ulrik Obris, the artistic director of the Serpentine Galleries, has said that from now on, ecology will be at the heart of everything that the galleries do. Obrist explains that the policy is far-reaching in the Serpentine programme, including their multi-platform project, General Ecology, for which the Serpentine became the first contemporary art institution to appoint an ecology curator, Lucia Pietroisti, and also so-called slow programming, which he describes as long-durational projects that expand beyond the conventional limits of a museum or a finite exhibition. Strikingly, Obrist, who is one of the most peripatetic of global curators, says, quote, I must also take a good look at my own way of working. Artists have opened the world to me, he says, and I've circuited the globe, making connections among them. This has become an essential function of the contemporary curator. I'm well aware of the part my trajectory has played, he adds, and that this volume of travel is unsustainable. He says that for years he has paid into a carbon offset fund every time he's flown, but now, he says, this is not enough, and so he will reduce his flying very significantly. I hope, he explains, as I reduce my travel, I can contribute to popularising methods of exchange that are more tenable for the well-being of the planet. The floods that hit Venice in November last year, the worst to hit the city in 50 years, have caused €360 million Euros worth of damage to public property, say representatives of the mayor Luigi Brugnaro. The estimate is based on an initial survey of repairs needed for jetties, paved areas, street lighting and buildings owned or managed by the municipality, including the civic museums. Individuals and businesses have submitted around 7,200 compensation claims to the city administration for a total of €93 million Euros by the end of January. St Mark's Basilica, located in the lowest-lying part of Venice, was the building worst affected by the floods. A system of valves recently installed in the narthex or foyer failed because it only protects against water up to 88 centimetres above mean sea level, a whole metre below the level the floodwaters reached. Veronica Redenigo's report also looks at the effects on Venice's churches and the Cadoro Palazzo on the Grand Canal, among other buildings. And finally, Deutsche Bank, which last year announced plans to cut 18,000 jobs, is scaling back its art collecting activities and has sold some key works of art. Among them is a vast abstract Gerhard Richter triptych, Faust from 1981, which hung in the lobby of the bank's Wall Street Tower. Friedhelm Hütter, who leads the company's art programme worldwide, told our German correspondent, Catherine Hickley, that the painting was sold to a collector at an undisclosed price. Deutsche Bank's troubles date back to the financial crisis of 2008. Since then, it's been fined for numerous regulatory infractions and attempts to merge with another German bank, Commerce Bank, collapsed last year. Hütter stresses that the bank is continuing to buy new works of art by emerging artists at fairs such as Fries, which the bank sponsors. He adds... Deutsche Bank is sticking to its art collection and will continue to promote and collect contemporary art, albeit in a lesser extent than before. You can read all these stories and more at theartnewspaper.com or on our app for iOS, which you can get from the App Store. We'll be back at the Foundling Museum after this. The American sculptor George Siegel was a master at depicting the richness of the everyday. His life-size plaster figures, which are often placed in familiar urban settings, seem to go about the same daily activities as the rest of us. Crossing the road, perhaps, or cycling to work, or simply travelling on public transport, as depicted in Siegel's work Woman on a Blue Bus Seat, NYC Map, which features in Bonham's post-war and contemporary art sale in Los Angeles. As Bonham Senior Director of Post-War and Contemporary Art on the West Coast, Sharon Squires explains, from early on in his career, Siegel was fascinated by the idea of being alone in a crowd. The bustling New York mass transport system, which, as a native New Yorker, Siegel knew very well, offered the artist the perfect environment in which to explore the notion of urban alienation. Woman on a Blue Bus Seat dates from 1997, a few years before the artist's death in 2000. It's a perfect summation of Siegel's life's work. For more about this story, visit bonhams.com. 
Welcome back. Now, portraying pregnancy at the Foundling Museum in London is an exhibition dedicated to representations of the pregnant female body through portraits over 500 years. The show brings together images of mainly British women depicted at a time when they were pregnant, whether visibly or not. On her recent London visit, one of our New York editors, Margaret Carrigan, went to the Foundling to talk to Karen Hearn, the exhibition's curator. So, Karen, I know there is a specific painting that was the genesis of this show for you. Can you tell me a little bit about what that painting was and why it was so interesting to you as to spur a whole other exhibition? The painting that you're referring to is a portrait of an unknown woman covered in pearls dating from around 1595. Uh, I was the curator of 16th and 17th century British art at the Tate and this picture was possibly going to come to us so it was my task to research it, champion it and indeed we did in due course acquire it and this was about around 20 years ago. I was fascinated that in the rather scant material that came with the picture, the documentation, there was no mention of the fact that, the screamingly obvious fact that the woman was at a late stage of pregnancy and that the decision had been taken to show her as such. Um, I think there was one reference to it in a scholarly publication, say, talking about the picture and then saying at the end, the sitter appears to be enceinte, because amazingly to us now, at that period, particularly for older people, the word pregnancy in itself was problematic. And really talking about pregnancy was still somehow a bit difficult, a bit transgressive. So I started researching the picture. So I realized immediately that uh, what I needed to look into was the question of historic dress, dress at this period, because first of all, one needs to be absolutely sure that the, pic the sitter is depicted as pregnant, and it isn't just one of those periods in which there's a fashion that makes many women look pregnant, as of course is the case with the Onolfini double portrait in the National Gallery, where Everybody assumes that Mrs. Onolfini is depicted as pregnant, but in fact it's a really rather unusual mid-15th century fashion. Well, I, I think it's really interesting that in your, in your research and scholarship on this, you found that there was brief instances throughout history where pregnancy was in vogue to depict, and specifically I think you said in um, Tudor and early Stuart portraits. What changed then? Why did it come into fashion to depict it? And then why did it go away so quickly? Well, the Tudor and uh, early Stuart period, which is very much my own personal and professional specialisation, uh, does seem to be really rather anomalous until the late 20th century, which is when we start seeing overt representations of the pregnant female body again. In the mid 16th century I think a whole a whole number of different uh, uh, reasons come into play these portraits do seem to arise in a Protestant context uh, I'm hugely generalizing but in a Catholic context uh, virginity is really prized above all whereas in a Protestant context it is uh, women uh, 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 as mothers and basically, the more children you had, the more God was blessing you. Uh, so England is, after the accession of Elizabeth I in 1558, a Protestant country. It's also a period in which you've got a lot of new families who've come up under Henry VIII. They've acquired land and property. Um, people who've succeeded through their own really talent and skills. So they are people who are very anxious to forge dynastic marriages, to maintain their position, to perhaps pretend that their families are older and more exalted that, than they were. So heraldry, uh, genealogy, the whole question of dynasty becomes very important. And I think perhaps these portraits come into that context after a while, we've got Elizabeth I, an um, uh, unmarried and childless queen on the throne. 
enormous anxiety about the succession to the English throne. Who will succeed her? And Elizabeth, of course, keeps completely quiet about that. The last thing she wants is for, um, as it were, power to accrue to any future successor. So people are very anxious about what will happen after Elizabeth dies, particularly once it's clear that she isn't going to mother, be the mother of an heir herself. I think that's actually really interesting that at that time, um, social and political change was the driving force behind depicting pregnancy. And then, of course, this exhibition at the Fowling Museum brings us up to contemporary times, and it is also looking at you know social media images of pregnancy, like you know Beyonce being depicted with pregnant with twins, and you know Demi Moore's kind of iconic Vanity Fair cover from the 1990s, and. In that way, I think over the past, you know, half century, there's been enormous cultural change around women's place in the work world and within society in general, women's rights. So how, in some ways, does that history of both celebrating or recognizing pregnancy and then putting it away again, how do we see that theme coming to, out to play in more contemporary society and contemporary art now? I think absolutely crucial to that is uh, women's art practice. So in the earlier period, uh, there were very few professional women artists. Uh, we do have in the exhibition the self-portrait by Mary Beale, the one of the first and perhaps the most uh, successful, the most prolific uh, women artists working in London in the 17th century. And it's her portrait of herself, her husband, and their first son. And there is a lot of evidence that she has actually depicted herself discreetly as pregnant with their second son. So that, uh, if that is the case, and, and scholars do think that, it does appear to be the case, this is the first uh, self-portrait of a woman painted while pregnant, uh, which is pretty remarkable. But otherwise, of course, it is really coming into the 20th century when women uh, are themselves thinking about their pregnant bodies. And I mean, once you have women uh, practicing, at the, being successful as, uh, as artists, it's very quickly, it becomes an absolutely central theme. We have in the exhibition works by uh, Chantal Joff, uh, Jenny Saville, a very interesting work from 1984 by an artist called uh, Gillen Howard. And uh, talking to these uh, artists, in, in every case, really, it's their own pregnancy that prompts them to move into a different direction in their practice and to consider uh, pregnancy, uh, early motherhood, not only their own, but that of um, others in their circle. Mm. And there can still be a bit of taboo around pregnancy today, you know, from disclosing it at work to talking about complications and health risks. How does being able to put these works and these images in a historical context in this exhibition kind of maybe help us reframe how we think about women in society being out there working, being pregnant, what, what that looks like in a more historical context when we take a more feminist lens to it? Well, I think as I carried, I'm, I've worked on this subject and I've taught on this subject, I've lectured on this subject for almost 20 years, but it's actually working on this exhibition and bringing it up to the present day that has really opened my eyes to the fact, that the importance of this as a topic. And I do actually propose that uh, this show and the accompanying book of the same name uh, do really provide us with a fresh lens to look at not only women's art history, but history itself. I've got portraits in the show of women depicted at a time when they were pregnant. Uh, you look into their history, you find that, for instance, um, uh, Catherine Carey, Lady Knowles, uh, a very important picture at the Yale Center for British Art uh, in New Haven, and therefore, was not possible to borrow from overseas, but it's represented in the book. She had between 12 and 
16 pregnancies, the evidence is varied. This woman was one of the four women of the bedchamber to Elizabeth I, and who was also her cousin. She conducted a busy public life in that important role, just going on pregnancy after pregnancy. So we have to think about what that meant for women of the period. Um, just getting on with it and think of the health conditions which of course now can be uh, treated or rectified today that they may have suffered after so many pregnancies. So it's a, in a way a small exhibition and a small book but the subject is potentially absolutely colossal. So if we think about possibly some quite famous portraits of women, not only British, the exhibition looks at British, uh, and think about the fact that the sitter may have been pregnant. Um, I do think it's very much a subject whose time has come. When I started researching, it was much harder to find out about women, as it were, their sort of childbearing history. And even, even now, the surviving information is partial and patchy. Um, there's more information at the elite level because there are better records for the aristocracy, the gentry. But there were paintings where I had a strong suspicion that the sitter was pregnant, but the evidence wasn't available. But now, as archives go online, that evidence is there. So uh, a portrait of uh, Lady Catherine Dormer dated 1659. I was absolutely certain that she, the, what the picture was telling us was that she was pregnant. Uh, but it was only this year that I was able to access uh, online the records. She gave birth to her son uh, in June 1659. And I'm afraid she died shortly afterwards. And that is actually a big theme of the exhibition, uh, that in the past childbearing or childbirth was very much seen of necessity in the context of death. The records don't really survive for us to be sure of the figures, but a significant number of women died in childbed. And of course, if you're having 12 children, you might eventually, you know, finally, it might you, know, you might not survive. And so I think the early portraits should also be seen in the context of records of women who are pregnant who might not survive. And certainly uh, a number of the pictures, particularly pictures in the book, are of women who we know didn't survive. But very interestingly, um, again, this is something that women don't talk about, but working on this project, women have really very much opened up about the difficulty of their own childbirth experiences and the seriousness of what happened and the touch and go nature of what happened. Uh, you know, this seems to be not an unusual experience, uh, but of course modern medicine, the key thing being antibiotics coming in in the um, mid-20th century. Uh, so this terrible thing, puerperal fever, which carried women off a few days after they gave birth. Um, so Jane Seymour, Henry VIII's queen, mm. that's probably what killed her after she'd given birth to the future Edward VI. Um, but the book finishes, uh, and the exhibition finishes, with Serena Williams, who was photographed for the front cover of Vanity Fair for uh, August 2017 by Annie Leibovitz in conscious emulation of the 1991 Vanity Fair cover showing Demi Moore. And of course, Williams has this amazing athlete's, muscular athlete's body. The a copy of Vanity Fair is uh, represented, is in the exhibition. But then if one looks at interviews with Serena Williams, it turns out that she, after giving birth, she then suffered a whole series of medical complications. And because it was 2017 and because she is a woman of wealth uh, in the American health system, uh, she survived and she pays tribute to the doctors. 
But it really brings us round full circle to those uh, Elizabethan women who died in childbed, and that nearly happened to Serena Williams. That is really interesting, and it really speaks to the need for more shows that can address this to kind of expand the discourse and allow women, not just women either, but just society at large, to learn how to talk about these really important health matters and issues of reproduction. Thank you so much. Thank you. Portraying pregnancy from Holbein to social media is at the Founding Museum in London until the 26th of April. And that's it for this week. You can subscribe to the Art Newspaper at theartnewspaper.com. Click on the subscribe link at the top left of the homepage. And if you haven't already subscribed to this podcast, please do. And do give us a rating or review if you've enjoyed it. The Art Newspaper podcast is produced by Julie Mahouska, Amy Dawson and David Clack. And David is also the editor. Thanks to Shabalala, to Lydia, to Margaret and to Karen. And thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye for now. The Art Newspaper Podcast is brought to you in association with Bonhams, auctioneers since 1793. To find out more, visit bonhams.com now.